Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. We can dance, we can dance, everybody look at your hands. We can dance, we can dance, everybody's taking the chance. Safe to dance, oh, it's safe to dance. Yes, safe to dance. And welcome to episode 229 of the Situational Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple to help you see the bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is an interview with firefighter Jonathan Hancock. John experienced a near miss event that found himself working alone inside of a residential dwelling fire. If you're new to the show, stick around after the feature segment to learn more about our mission, how you can attend or host a live event, and how to get connected with us on social media. All right, let's jump into our feature segment, my interview with near miss survivor, Jonathan Hancock. Jonathan Hancock, or John as he prefers to be called, is a resident of Mount Vernon, Indiana. He's married to Jennifer and they have one son, Owen. John has been a firefighter, volunteer firefighter for 15 years, uh, three years with the Crossville, Illinois Volunteer Fire Department and 12 years with the Black Township Fire and Rescue where he is now. Uh, He has served as uh, up to and including the rank of captain uh, until 2015 when he stepped down from his firefighting rank back to the firefighter position to spend more time with his family. He's an Indiana Firefighter 1 and 2 certified, an EMT basic certified, hazmat operations certified, uh, industrial extrication, rope rescue, uh, industrial firefighter, surface water rescue, and grain bin rescue certified. I met John while I was teaching a class in Indiana, and he had a near miss event that he wanted to share. So Let's uh, let's listen in on his or watch the interview that I had with John Hancock. All right, so today with me I have as my guest John Hancock, a firefighter in Black Township in near Mount Vernon, Indiana. And John and I had the opportunity to be together in a program that I did in Evansville, Indiana earlier this month and Oftentimes during the program, what I do is I ask people in the audience if they have had a near-miss event, and if they have, to share their miss ex- near-miss experience so that the students in the session have an opportunity to learn something from someone who's had a near-miss event, and John had one. And then I asked him afterwards if he'd be willing to come on to the show and to share his experience with a bigger audience, because I think there's some really valuable lessons and takeaways here from from his experience. So, John, welcome to the SA Matters show. Thank you for having me. That's great, to, great to have you. So, let's start by just uh, giving me, giving us the the viewers and the listeners a little bit of background about you and how long you've been around the fire service and a little bit about your department and the kind of things that the services they provide and the area that they cover and that kind of thing, just the kind of the frame it up. Okay. Well, I'm a 15 year volunteer firefighter, uh, three years with a Crossville, Illinois volunteer fire company and 12 years with black township fire. I've served with up to the ranks of captain within the department of captain fire division. Our department 
is part is right now a combination. Uh, we, in the beginning, we were mostly volunteer. Um, we have 134 square miles of territory. We cover two districts, Black and Lynn Township. Uh, the majority of it is a mix of residential, commercial, industrial. Um, we have 18, 18 major industries within our district um, with six of them Fortune 500 companies. Um, but for the most part, it's a lot of rural land um, that we respond to within our district. Okay. Now, um, a few years ago, I was down in your area. I, for, I forgot that I would actually done a program for your department as well. And I was doing work for um, Babcock and Wilcox. Are they in your response area? Yes, they are one of our industries that we respond to. Okay. Yeah, that kind of frames up for me then um, some of the heavy industry that you're describing because that, that's pretty heavy industry of the – of the work that they're that they're doing, and that'd be in, in your in your first due. Eighteen of those heavy industry um, uh, Fortune 500 companies in your area. Yeah, we have two uh, refineries: Country Mark Refinery and Valero ab, or Ethanol Fuel Plant. Um, we protect the entire port of Mount Vernon, which is the largest producing port in the state currently. For the entire state of Indiana, we produce more export than any other port of the other two. Um, we have Sobic Plastics, which is the largest chem or plastics manufacturing facility in the United States. Uh, was for the world for, the, for over 50 years. It was the leading plastics manufacturer. So all the plastics that came from everything started here in our, in our area. Um, GAF is one of our major industries. They produce a lot of the shingles that you see on homes. Um, those are some of the major industries we have. Um, okay. We also have uh, an anhydrous ammonia manufacturing facility that stores a lot of millions and millions of gallons of anhydrous on the river port that also exports that as well by barge. Wow. Now, we, also, we protect two rivers as well, with the Wabash and the Ohio. So um, 134 square miles, you have – one station, more than one station? We have two stations. We have 12 apparatus and two boats. Okay. And then you said you were a combination department. How many career people and how many, I don't know if they're volunteer or paid on call. Kind of break that down for me. We had 10 daytime staff from the 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. with two crew working the day. Uh, they're they're, they're part-time staff right now, and I'm one of the individuals. And then we have 35 volunteers that respond with the day crew as well as after the day crew leaves at 4 p.m. and covers the entire time frame afterwards. And do you guys do any form of a medical response? Yes. Our, pretty much our number one call is EMS. We're a BLS non-transport service. We respond with all EMS on their calls. Um, we have specialties in heavy high angle rescue, um, industrial education, hazmat, technical ops, um, confined space, rope rescue, um, grain bin rescue. We do a lot of things. Wow. And uh, what's your population? <sighs> Off top of hand, I'd have to say that just with what we cover, it's probably 2,000 to 2,500. Okay. Well, you provide a lot of varied services for a – it's a large geographic area, but with a rather small population, but a complexity because of the of the industry and such is, is obviously present for you guys. Um, and then um, what's your call volume per year estimated? 330 to 350 is average for us every year. Okay. And uh, you, do you have any kind of mutual aid or automatic aid programs with neighboring departments? We have an automatic aid in Lynn Township with New Harmony because of the fact there's no fire protection agency up there. We dual dispatch on all the calls that occur in that area. Um, but within the county of all nine departments, we have a mutual aid agreement so that if we need them or they need us, they can call us and we'll respond if necessary. Okay. And uh, so let's let's segue to the event that that leads up to the opportunity for us to have this conversation, and uh, that is a near miss event that occurred um, to you in 2007. 
So give it, give us the lead up to what was uh, what what kind of day it was, what time of year it was, what kind of things were going on in your life that day. It was a uh, summer of 2007. It was a beautiful day, like it was today. It was hot, very hot. I remember that. Um, I was at home listening on my scanner as Point Township, the agency who was dispatched initially, was called to a house fire and. I knew at the time they usually didn't have much manpower during the daytime. And so I started making my way toward the station because I figured one, they're going to need either water because they have no hydrant supply down there. It's pretty much farmland and a few spot houses here and there. And two, the manpower issue. And as I was getting closer and closer, I heard them automatically call for us as a second due company for water and manpower. So I arrived at the station myself, and two other individuals at the time, um, I'm sorry, three individuals, my, the driver, uh, myself, uh, my, my second nozzleman, and our officer on the truck. And we responded down there in our engine seven, which was our primary pumper at the time. And as we started getting closer toward the fire, a couple miles out, you could start seeing the header cloud coming. And we knew we were starting to get up to something good. It wasn't very heavy smoke, but it was starting to show that it was getting bigger and bigger. And we really weren't hearing much from the guys on the scene because they pretty much had three or four there at the time, and they're too busy to talk on the radio. And when we would holler and we wouldn't get much response, if any, um, we did communicate with our chief a little bit as he was responding. He was heading that way, but he was still for pretty far out because he was at work. Okay, now at this at this point, are the only agencies responding to this Point Township and you guys, or is there other auto aid or mutual aid coming as well? No, we're the we're the closest agency for them because where they're at, they're at the very southern tip of the state, and they border the the Wabash and the Ohio. So there's no way for anybody from Kentucky or Illinois to assist them. It's just us, and then the the third new agencies are about 15, 20 minutes out. Okay. And they're, they've not been called. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. That's fair. Um, so you're responding on engine seven with a crew of three Four. crew of four. Yeah, sorry. And, that's right. And, uh, at that time you're a firefighter. Is there, a, is there an officer on your engine? Yeah, there was, I believe he was a safety officer at the time, the individual who was in the officer seat. Okay. And, uh, are you all having any conversations en route? If you, if you can remember, you know, things that you guys as a crew might have been discussing um, while you were en route to the call? Not that I remember per se. Like I said, it's been almost 11 years since it happened. Okay. But I would think that we were talking about what our game plan was going into this, like where we would be needed and how we would go about stuff because – we, as the pumper crew, were going to assist somehow. We only had a thousand gallon water on the tank, but we had a tanker coming behind us with 3,000 gallons. And we knew that they had a tanker of 2,000 gallons that they were running as well. And the nearest fill site was going to be at Sabic, which was our closest fill site or the uh, John T. Myers Dam that they had their pump system running. So we had at least five, six miles of travel time back and forth on water supply relay to deal with. Okay. And just two tankers in the loop at that time. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, you can, you can see the header of smoke on the, on the horizon, so to speak. And, uh, as you guys are approaching the scene, what, what are you seeing? Well, as we came around the corner from where the, uh, house was, it was about, maybe a third of a mile from Bone Bank Road and you had to make a sharp left. So you couldn't see it because of all the trees. But once we got to where we were, the clearing was, you could see that Point Township's engine was first on scene, sitting in the driveway on the AB side of the house. Um, they had already tilted their cab because their truck's old and it has a, a coolant issue. So it has to have the cab tilted to stay running and keep cooled off in the summertime. And the crew, they had were just on the front yard doing a defensive attack through the windows with a nozzle. So we pulled in to the left of them a little bit forward 
And then we started pulling our flake lines off of our cross lays and figuring out where we needed to be. And they had asked us to go in through the Bravo side of the structure on this house, which was a two story balloon frame. Yeah. Pause for a moment and and describe this house for me and both in, in design and size. So it was a two story balloon frame, uh, typical front end of the house, you know, you would see if you got to the B side, you could see there was an extension on the back from where they had added a kitchenette area as well as the laundry and the bathroom onto that house at some point in time. So it wasn't original to the house. You could tell that it was a difference. Um, you went back on to the C side, you really couldn't see much because we had a fence there to navigate around if you were going to. And then the D side, there was a giant tree on that, on that area that was pretty close to the house itself. Okay. And uh, estimate the square footage of this house so we get an idea how big it is. If I had to guess, I would think 40 by 80 for the, the balloon frames of itself. So, and that's two stories. So 40 by 80 is 1,200, two stories, 2,400. 2,400, not including the uh, kitchen area, which I would say would be another 20 by 80 added to that. Okay. And does it have a basement? I don't remember if it did or not. We never, like, we never checked for it. And I would think if it did, it had an old type cellar on those old homes because they usually do. Okay. And um, were the were the occupants present when you guys arrived? The occupants were home when the fire started, and he's the one that actually called 911. So he was still re remaining on the scene with us whenever our first unit from Point arrived. Okay. So you guys know confirmed by the owner that there's there's no one inside. That's correct. There was no okay. other occupants but him. Okay, so you guys get on the scene and uh, I think we stopped, we paused where you said you were flaking a line. So take us from there, the size of line and what you were gonna do with it. Okay, so we pulled off an inch and three quarter cross lay, which is what we run on our trucks with an adjustable nozzle. And we, me and my partner, I was nozzled and he was back up, go up to the B side entrance where you would go into the laundry room first, as soon as you entered this doorway. And as you progressed further, you would look to your left and behind it was the bathroom. So it was a small laundry area with a bathroom attached behind it. Yeah, we, do we, have, do we have to hold on a second. <laughs> I, missed, I missed an important question. Describe, even before you made to the point of entry, describe the smoke and fire conditions. What, what are you seeing there? I, um, I'm sorry. Okay. That's fine. Um, we were seeing what appeared to be smoke and fire on the first floor um, with heavy smoke coming out of the second floor windows and eaves. So we weren't seeing much fire up there at that point. It hadn't broke through the windows, but the majority of our fire was through the first floor where they were initially doing the fire attack. And you could see fire through the first floor? Yes. They had busted the windows out and they were doing the attack in the left bedroom, I think, or left room of the first floor. So it's either the parlor or dining room, I would assume. Okay. And what, and they're using uh, like an inch and three quarter line? Yeah, they were using inch and three quarters also. And were they making progress? Uh, not at the time. They were having water issues as well. Okay. And the smoke condition is uh, heavy smoke, black smoke? Gray smoke, I would say at the time it wasn't really black. Okay. The header that was coming, we were coming in on was still gray at the time, but it was still a thick column that we could see. Okay. All right. So you guys go to the door on the B side. Yes. Uh, with an inch and three quarter line with a thousand gallons of water on your truck. Mm -hmm. And how many are on your line? Is there three of you? Two. Two. The engineer Good. was running the pump. The safety officer was running safety at the scene. Okay. Um, All right. And, there, and the Point Township uh, engineer for their department, he was running command from his truck. So the engineer was the incident commander? For Point Township's engine, yes. Our engineer was running our truck, though. Okay. All right. Uh, keep, keep talking me through. Okay. So me and my partner, we go in through the door. Um, didn't have to force it or anything. It was pretty much easy open. 
go in there. We could start seeing smoke and fire coming over our heads. Uh, there was a pretty good rollover in the kitchen area from the fire progressing through the through that area. So I go to make a quick attack, hit the ceiling, cool it off, look to my left into the bathroom. There's a little bit of fire in the ceiling in there from just the smoke hanging in the air and burning off. So I hit that, cool it off, and we start pushing forward more. And then I get about halfway into the kitchen where I'm about six feet from the door that goes into the balloon frame structure itself. And I'm still fighting off rollover, doing a pretty good job with it. Start inching more and more. And then I get to where I'm a couple feet from the door and I stopped at that point and I'm still fighting it, doing pretty good work. And then I'm just going for it, not even thinking about what's going on, just doing a heck of a job. And then all of a sudden I feel the hose jerk behind me. Just like someone just pulled really hard. I had, my hand was on the bell, the bell slammed shut. And I'm just sitting there looking like, what's going on? And I look back and my partner was gone and the safety officer's out the door and he's jerking the hose and he's yelling at me and I'm just like, what's going on? So I take off, go out the door following the hose line. And then as I get out, he's screaming, the safety officer's screaming at me. My partner's on the ground. He's got his mask off and he's just sitting there kneeling and I'm trying to figure out what's going on and I'm yelling back at him because I didn't know what was going on. And at that point, it's nobody knows what's going on at this point. And then that's where we were at that point. So um, I want to back up to when you were inside advancing. Was the Point Township crew still applying water from the outside when yeah. you guys were advancing on the inside? Yes. Mm, do you think that do you think that um might have complicated some things for you guys with them with them continuing that that external attack as you were attempting the internal yeah i think that the, thinking about it now in retrospect they were probably pushing the fire toward me uh -huh. i was having such a hard time with rollover and fighting it yeah um but they only had the one guy on the hand line so they didn't have enough people to make an interior attack on their own Right. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking is what they would be doing would be pushing, pushing that in your direction from where they were applying their water to where you guys were making your entry. It would sound a whole lot like what they were doing, what might have made what you were doing a little bit more difficult. Right. Okay. So you're inside. It, it's uh, Describe the heat condition before you guys get pulled back out of there. What, what's that like? It didn't really feel that bad. I could tell there was heat. Um, I'm used to it, though, after doing this for so long. I know when it gets too hot, and it really wasn't hot enough that I could feel it burning through my Nomex. So I was in a comfortable condition. I didn't feel that normal feel of, you know, when it's way too hot and, you know, you got to do something quick or get out. Yeah. So, uh, we, were doing, we were in pretty good tenable conditions at that point. Okay. And then the, uh, then the, the line gets jerked. The bell gets shut. You're like, what the heck's going on? You turn around, your partner, who you thought was behind you, is gone. And at back at the door is a safety officer pulling on the line, and that's making you say, what the heck? And then you come outside, and your partner's laid out with a mask off. And so what the heck just happened here? Well, according to my partner, he had told me that he had a mask failure um, in the process of advancing the hose his mask had gotten knocked off his face um, and he had caught a bunch of smoke and it caused him to back out. And that's why he went out the way he did. Okay. He was out there trying to catch his breath and, you know, take a break because he was hot and sweaty. We were all hot and sweaty because like I said, it was a July type summer. It was very, very humid that day and temperature was probably near a hundred if I had to guess. Okay. So he just, got his face piece knocked loose and out he went did he say later on that he tried to tell you that he was leaving or he just you know was he on full on survival mode just get out of here real expectations because that's how it matters know your limit know your partner's limit because that's how it matters assumptions are bad that's how it matters Rubber BPE is important because SA matters.
Flawed situational awareness is a really big deal. SA matters. Know your water supply, because SA matters. Bears and cougars, SA matters. Go versus no go, because SA matters. Confidence is good, overconfidence is bad. SA matters. Studies matter, because SA matters. SA matters, so don't get angry. When the pigs are eating lemons, SA matters. Our academy class is going home today because we know that SA matters. SA matters! Got his face piece knocked loose and out he went. Did he say later on that he tried to tell you that he was leaving or he just, you know, was he on full on survival mode, just get out of here? He said he did, but I don't remember hearing a single thing that he said. It wasn't until the hose got jerked from me that I realized that he wasn't in, in that room anymore. Okay. So, um, what's he, what's his status now? Because did, did he take on some, some heat that he breathed? Hot gases? Is he burned? What, what's what's up with that? Uh, he was in okay condition. He got tricked by EMS, and they just said that he just caught a little bit of smoke, and that's all it was. So there was no uh, secondary injury or anything from that. Okay. And uh, so how would you describe the, you know, this as, an, as a near-miss event from the perspective of, you know, where you were at, at the time this happened? Uh, I would say it's very unnerving, especially when you know you've been left in the building by yourself on the hand line and you've got fire rolling over your head. That was very unsettling to me. And that's why I came out screaming the way I did, because I didn't know why he left me, for one, because that's the number one thing they teach you. You don't leave your partner for any reason. Yeah. And then, and then you're, you're in there alone and you don't even know you're in there alone. Right. Um, I know it's kind of after the fact and kind of hard to tell, but had the safety officer not been there, like right place at the right time to see this second person bail and then to start tugging on your line, let's say the safety officer would have been, say, around on the A side where he didn't see this, and then your partner bailed and nobody knew you were in there alone, where, where do you think this might have went for you? I'd have probably still been in there fighting it because I would have had no clue. I, would, I had my task. I knew what I was doing. I was making headway with it and I was going to keep inching forward. That was my ultimate goal was to get into that doorway so I could get to that balloon frame area and start hitting it before it climbed up the stairwell or got into the second floor area. That was my game plan the whole time. And the, uh, the second guy who was on the line with you, how much experience did he have as a firefighter? He had probably about the same amount at the time that I did then, um, four to five years. Okay. But All he right. had served with another agency before he came on to our department. Mm hmm And uh, so where, where did it go from here? How did things progress? So after we have our screaming match at each other and we start butting heads and realizing what had happened, then we change tactics. Um, we get – we go and take a break, me and my partner did, because they pull us from the fire. They want us to go get checked by EMS, you know, cool off, get a drink, all that stuff. And then the additional crews had showed up at this point. Um, two guys took over our hand line and were fighting it from the doorway. So they never made interior. They just stayed exterior fire, and it was purely defensive at this point. Um, so we go about – you know, rehabbing for a little bit and I go and take other jobs, you know, do what I need to do, help out here and there, um, running hose lines, relieving other individuals, things like that. And, uh, was the, was the rest of the call uh, pretty non-event as far as, um, you know, near miss things happening, they will, anything else happen? Um, well, I mean, the fire eventually broke through the, the roof of the structure and it, when it vented itself, it just took off and kept going to the point to where it took the whole structure down with it, um, maybe a half hour later. Okay. And uh, when when you guys got back to the station, 
or at some point thereafter, the next day, the next week, the next month, was there any kind of a, a debrief from this, a discussion about, you know, what happened and, and you know, what you guys could learn, learn, learn from this happening? Yeah, we discussed it a little bit. Um, the basic thing we talked about was, you know, making sure your partner was communicating with each other on what's going on and if they need to leave. Um, uh, radio communications was also discussed because apparently they had tried to haul at me on the radio and I didn't hear that either. And we weren't sure if it was my radio was an issue at the time or if I just didn't hear the conversation. Um, we still don't know to this day what happened there. Well, did your radio work adequately after you got back out and such? Were you able to hear things on your radio then? Yeah, my radio was working fine then, and it was working prior to the call itself. So yeah. I, I didn't have issues, but uh -huh. somewhere in this point, either I had an issue with the radio or I just did not hear the conversation that transpired. Yeah. You remember in class, we talked about that auditory exclusion. Yes. The, um, you know, the shutting down of the, li of the listening. And I've had a lot of responders share with me their experiences of being inside, uh, especially in uh in in stressful situations inside and and not being able to hear the things that are being said on the radio some sometimes what they didn't hear were evacuation orders and the tones indicating an evacuation uh and it's pretty unnerving to them to think that their radio you know is clipped one inch from their ear on their lapel and they're not they're not able to hear you know the the traffic which sometimes was pretty critical traffic that they missed right yeah um, so what lessons learned or advice would you offer to, uh, somebody who's watching the show that they could learn from this event that happened to you? Mistakes that I know I made based on, especially from going to your classes was a 360 I never did. I wish I had because I could have maybe seen different views of the house than I did at the time. Um, there definitely should have been their communication on strategy and tactics between the agencies because the defensive crew wasn't helping out the offensive crew that was trying to go in and do something because they were literally pushing the fire. Um, I would say for training purposes, individuals need to know that, you know, don't leave your partner for any reason. You know, like I said, communication is key. Um, letting them know what you're doing and where you're going. And if you need to get out for whatever reason, you know, so that way if you do have something happen to you and you become incapacitated, you have somebody there. Uh, for the most part though, definitely I, I took it as a learning experience afterwards because it was very ner unnerving for me for a while. Uh -huh. Now, at <laughs> I know you're married now, but at the time that this happened, were you married? No, I was single. Okay, so um, were, you, were you living at home, like with your parents? Uh, no, I when I moved over here, I got an apartment and was staying by myself. So okay. I'd been living on my own probably for a couple of years. Okay, and did you at any point after this happened have a conversation with anybody who was an important who was important in your life at the time to tell them what happened to you? No, I pretty much kept it to myself because back then, you know, we didn't talk about things that happened. For one, I didn't want to upset them that this happened because they would told me, you know, you need to quit because that's not safe and that's not funny. Um, so, you know, we were in my generation and when we started back in 03, you know, we didn't talk about our feelings. We didn't talk about the near misses. We just chalked it up and moved on and did our job. And that's what we did. Mm hmm. Would you say this uh, this event, as it played out, scared you? Afterwards, yeah. I mean, I was a little uneasy about it. Um, I didn't feel comfortable working with that individual that was on the hand line with me afterwards, and I made it known to him that I wasn't going to go on a hand line with him again for a while because he had left me like he did. And I hated doing that because he was – at the time, he was my best friend. Mm. But – I just did not like the idea of him leaving me like he did. That very much scared me to the point where I took a break for a little bit from the department on making fires. I did the medical stuff still, but I didn't go to the fires. 
And and at, once you started going back to to firefighting, um, and you went in on the next structure fire, were you thinking to yourself, what they going to leave me this time again? Were you thinking about that? I was definitely looking over my shoulder, making sure they were there. Um, and it took maybe a year or so before we actually did another fire where we made interior because we don't make many structure fires. And sometimes by the time we do get there, it becomes a defensive attack. Um, but yeah, whenever we made our next attack, I definitely was looking around to make sure people were with me and I was communicating with them better. So that way I knew what they were doing. They knew what I was doing and so forth. Okay. And did, did y'all ever figure out what happened to his SCBA? Was it just that his face piece got dislodged or was there something mechanical wrong with it? Or, uh, you know, how, how did he get into the spot that he got into? According to him, he said that, excuse me, that when we were pushing the line in, the, the nozzle or the hose line came up and hit the bottom of his mask where his regulator was and it pushed it away from his face and caused his bottom straps to come loose. So we went back and looked at everything and the straps were good. You know, there was no damage to the regulator itself. So we knew that there was an actual mechanical issue. It was just wrong place, wrong time situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th did he talk at all about how the event uh, impacted him? Cause I would guess, you know, that when you're inside and all of a sudden you have your face piece knocked loose, that can be pretty, pretty jarring experience. I remember being involved in a training fire once where we went up the, the stairs to the second floor and you would go to the top of the stairwell and make like a 180 right hand turn and go back along where the stairs were and the fire that they had built was in a room at the end of that hallway. And so when we come up, when we come up the top of the stairs, we made a sharp right turn and the third person on the line who made the sharp right turn, he stood up when he made the turn and there was a large banister on the top of the, um, of the railing. And at the time, our style of SCBA had a, had a uh, low pressure hose that went to a regulator that was down on the hip, the old MSA style. And when he rounded that turn, he caught that low pressure hose on that, on the, on the, ball of that banister and it literally took his whole face piece off and we're up there and it, it's like it's smoky it's black it's hot and all we hear him say like in the clearest of voices I need to get out of here and I remember how stunning it was of how did he say that so clearly? You know, it was like it was it was it was beautiful. I heard, I, you know, wasn't muffled or anything. Well, we didn't know that his face piece wasn't on his face anymore, and uh, he described that as like a near death experience for him. Right? Was the was the guy on on the end of the other end of your event um, feeling? You know, did he say anything about what he was thinking? Not that I remember at the time. Me, I was pretty upset with him afterwards, so we didn't talk for a little bit because of it. And we never discussed the issue again because I didn't want to bring up bad feelings between us. Okay. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Um, is there anything about this event that, that you would have wanted to discuss that I didn't, I, that I didn't bring up because I didn't ask the right question? Um, I would think that pretty much you covered everything. Okay. The biggest issue we had though, like I said, was water, um, because our supply was five, five miles away and we were at the time running only two trucks waiting on another units from 20 minutes out to come in with their tankers. So we had pretty much the time delays where we would have to conserve water and make do with what we had. Right. Right. All right. Um, John, if somebody wanted to reach you, is there an email that they could reach out if they had some questions or wanted to talk with you further about this? Yes. They could reach me at my email, which is J dot H A N C O C K one four five at hotmail.com. Okay. 
all right, which I have and I'll put in the show notes as well. Uh, thank you for, for taking some time to, uh, to spend with me this afternoon. And I know it's probably about dinner time, so I'm not going to hold you up any further. And uh, thanks to your family for graciously being so quiet in the house. And I know how hard that can be. And I know you got little ones and I know that your wife's probably, probably somehow entertaining them because they, it, it's been, it's been quiet. And I, and so let them know how much I appreciate that too, so that we could have this conversation. I uh, will do. Thank you. She did a great job with them. Yes, she did. On behalf of all of our viewers and listeners, thank you, John, for the courage to share your experience and your message. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and 65,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you work in a high-risk, high-consequence decision environment, then I'm here to help improve your safety and your survival and to help you accomplish the most important goal of all, and that's to go home to the ones who love you. I would like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters training for their team members. The Ohio Fire Chiefs Conference in Columbus, Ohio. The Evansville Fire Department in Evansville, Indiana. Fire Rescue International in Dallas, Texas. The Northwest Fire District in Houston, Texas. The Missouri City Fire Department in Missouri City, Texas. And the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in Honolulu, Hawaii. If you're interested in attending one of our programs that are upcoming, um, by the time this program airs, we will have completed our training for Eagle Materials Corporation in Grapevine, Texas on September 13. But on September 17 and 18, we will be in Odessa, Texas for the Odessa Fire Department. September 22nd, the Columbia Shoe Swap Regional District in British Columbia, Canada. September 24 to 27, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. September 29, the Badger Firefighters Association in West Bend, Wisconsin. October 12, the Minnesota Fire Chiefs Association Conference in St. Paul, Minnesota. October 13 and 14, the Boggs Run Fire Department in Benwood, West Virginia. October 16th, the University of Ontario Institute of Technology Graduate School Lecture in Toronto, Ontario. October 17, the Association of Canadian Ergonomist Conference in Sudbury, Ontario. October 19, the Loudoun County Fire Officers Association Seminar, Loudoun County, Virginia. October 22 to 27, the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, Bremerton, Washington. October 28th, the Clearwater Regional Fire Service, Alberta, Canada. And October 29 to November 1, back at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington. To see the location of all the upcoming events, just head over to the samatters.com website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Live Training Dates. If you're interested in hosting a program, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage and I'll give you a call and we'll get something set up. If you want to become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there's a couple ways you can do that. Check the show notes to see how you can get connected with us through newsletter membership, podcast subscription, YouTube subscriber, or follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. 
There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 229 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you to my guest, John Hancock, for sharing your incredible near-miss story with us. Thank you to our awesome sponsors, Midwest Fire and Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, and organizations that have hosted Situational Awareness Matters training programs for their team members. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted the live virtual internet-based training programs. Thank you to the more than 2,000 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. But most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.